Grace, Hope, Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. The teaching application verse for tonight is Deuteronomy chapter 31, starting with verse 3. It says, The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. On May 14th, 1948, seemingly overnight, Israel did what no other nation has done before. A nation which had been scattered and for all purposes ceased to exist altogether was regathered together back into her land. The first Jewish state to exist in 2,000 years. She was immediately attacked by five Arab nations and surprising to many, Israel won. Israel is a nation even today, surrounded by those who despise her and seek to destroy her. On November 29, 2005, during the UN's annual International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian People Conference, they couldn't think of a longer name, (laughs) not only was there on display a large map with Israel Israel noticeably removed, but there were also calls for the end of the Jewish state. Those calls have grown and become even more pronounced over the years. The land that Israel has the right to possess is a very sticky subject, and it's it's not just with politicians and other world leaders, but it's also a sticky subject with Christians these days. Should there be a Palestinian state? What is the land that is the promised land? These days, the Palestinian state is a political hot potato. No one seems really able to handle it well, least of all our fearless leader. The term Palestine is rarely used in the Old Testament. It's used in the Old Testament to refer to a small piece of land on the southwest coast that was occupied by the Philistines. It was actually a translation of the Hebrew word Pelesheth. Now, Palestine is never, never used in Scripture to refer to the whole land occupied by Israel. The term Palestine is never used in the New Testament. Now, if you turn, if your Bible has maps in the back, and you turn to the map in the back, you will probably find one that says Palestine in the time of Christ. You should mark out Palestine and put in Israel. You'll be doing the translators a favor. So it was not until the Romans actually defeated uh, Bar Kokhba during the Bar Kokhba, Kokhba revolt that we see the term Palestine used to refer to what was before known as the land of Israel. Why was it used? Well, the emperor Hadrian, he knew the value of using symbols and terms for propaganda. The Philistines had been Israel's chief enemies. And so he used the Latin form of that Philistine to refer to the land of Israel as Palestine. Later in the time of the church historian Eusebius, Christians began to adopt the term Palestine to refer to Israel. Many still do to this day, even though Israel is back in her land. Now, God, on the other hand, he doesn't care what people have named and renamed the land. He doesn't care about the boundaries that that men have decided on for the land. I firmly firmly believe that one day there will be 
uh, in Israel fully occupying the whole promised land which God has promised them. What is that land? Well, to fully understand, we need to look at what God promised Abraham, then Moses, and then Joshua. In Genesis 15, starting with verse 18, it says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. In Joshua 1.4, says, From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. In Deuteronomy 1.7, Turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains, and in the lowland. In the south and on the, south, on the sea coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And in Deuteronomy 11, 24, it says, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. From the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea, shall be your territory. So we've got a, a map you could take a look at to see in that land that God promised to Israel is quite large. Much larger than the land that they occupy today. Now there's actually another promise in Scripture regarding this land, but this promise is made to those who divide up the land that God has given Israel. We find that promise in Joel chapter 3. And it says, In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem... I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel, for they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. It amazes me that so many Christians these days are so willing, if not even eager, to remove God's promises from Israel. Many denominations and churches hold to theology that says that Israel made one too many mistakes and now God has removed his covenants from them and placed them on the church. They will go so far as to say that starting with the book of Acts, wherever Israel is mentioned, it is actually referring to the church. This is what is known as replacement theology. And where you find this being taught, if you happen to be there, you should leave. God does not take it well when people call him a liar. That's essentially what replacement theology does. It says that God lied to Israel about his promises being forever. If that is the case, then, my friends, you and I have a lot to worry about. We should be very concerned because God can remove his promises from us if he has so removed them from, Christ from Israel. Now, moving into chapter 34, we will read about the borders of Israel uh, and, and, and as given to them by God prior to their entering into Canaan. We'll notice that the borders that he gives Israel in Numbers are not the same borders that God promised Abraham, and as we've already seen. We'll answer the question, why is that? We'll also talk some more about being in the land and what that meant for the Transjordan tribes and for you and me. Moving into chapter 35, we'll talk about the cities of the Levites and the six cities of refuge and what they were and what they mean to us today. Finally, in chapter 36, as we close out numbers, we'll talk about God's promises to complete the good work that he has begun. So we dig in with chapter 34 now in verse 1. And it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, the land of Canaan to its boundaries. So Israel was going to receive the land by inheritance. That word is important because an inheritance, while freely given, is not freely earned. Israel would still have to drive out the Canaanites from the land. 
taking control of the land by conquest and then living in the land as the people of God. Of course, both the giving of the land and Israel's conquest of the land would be by the power of God. While they would experience the battle and take part in the driving out of the Canaanites, they should never think that they received the land because they earned it or they deserved it or because they somehow merited it. Nor should they think that they continue in the land by their own merit. For it's all by the grace of God from beginning to end. The land was given to them as an inheritance as promised to Abraham as kept by God. Without God, not only would they have remained slaves in Egypt, but they would not have been able to claim their inheritance nor remain in the land. The same is true for the Christian, who certainly has a role to play in salvation, yet his salvation was purchased by Jesus and is freely is given freely by the grace of God through faith. The role, then, of the Christian is to take possession of this new life that we have in Christ and live it out to the glory of God. Now, Jesus did not die for us because we are good enough. We do not receive salvation through Christ by our goodness, nor do we continue in Christ by our righteousness. From beginning to end and everywhere in between, we are wholly dependent on the grace of God. To struggle to maintain salvation out of a fear of losing it is to depend on works so that we can maintain our saved status. That keeps us slaves of sin. This seeks to place glory on the flesh. It declares that having begun in the Spirit, we are made perfect by the flesh. Salvation didn't come from works. And it isn't maintained by works. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. But to wholly live out this incredible freedom, we must realize that desiring to please God And glorifying His Son is a hallmark of freedom from sin. As all who are in Christ are slaves to righteousness. And every good tree bears good fruit. Now, later Israel, having been given the land and having been strengthened by God to take the land, would struggle living in the land because they would disobey the Lord and court the pagan nations outside of the land. Of course, here we also find an interesting similarity between Israel and the Christian. We all have been given salvation and have been equipped by God to live out our salvation, yet we all have a very hard time living in the land. And that is often because we have a habit of looking outside the land to see what we might be missing out on. We notice here that the land that Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had asked to possess is located outside of these borders. And though the land on the east side of the Jordan belonged to Israel, those lands were not considered to be the promised land. Does that mean God has disinherited them? And they will now be living outside of the will of God. Well, it was most definitely the will of God that they live inside the land. God told them to cross over the Jordan. Yet they chose according to their own reasoning. They determined that the land outside of the Jordan seemed better suited for them. It's always dangerous to assume that you know better than God. The Holy Spirit inspired men to write the books of the Bible. And in the books, we find all kinds of literary tools of writing. There are tools such as alliteration, paradox, poetry, double meaning, plays on words, and more. In our chapter, chapter 34 of Numbers, in our chapter, we find a play on words here. That is this, 
Abraham was given the original promise of God to bring from him many nations, including a special people and a land for them to possess. Now, Abraham's nephew, his name was Lot. God tells us the tribes of Israel will be assigned their land by Lot. And of course, Lot in these two instances is not the same Hebrew, Hebrew word. Lot's name is just that. It's a name. And it comes from another word that means wrapped or covered. And when God speaks of the tribes receiving their portion of the land by Lot, it is the word goral. Now that means allotment or receiving that which has been assigned to you. Now you guys probably remember the story of Lot, but let me refresh you in case you don't or you don't remember some parts of it. Lot was with Abraham when he left traveling as God directed him to a new land that God would show him. Now as we talked about the other week, once, once uh, Abraham got into the land, got to Canaan, actually Bethel in Canaan, which means house of God. Once they got there, they discovered that there was a famine. And of course, Abraham and everyone with him went down to Egypt, which is not something God told them to do. They went down to Egypt and they got into a lot of troubles down there, ended up leaving Egypt and coming back up to Bethel. Once they got back up to Bethel, we get to this uh, narrative of Lot. Now, Lot looked out from the camp of Abram and looked at the plains of Jordan, and he decided that he liked it. He liked the plains of Jordan. He desired them. Now, this is where we come into this play on words. See, Lot, whose name is derived from the word for wrapped or covered, while he was with Abram, he was wrapped in the covering of God's blessing that was on Abram and on his camp. Now, Abraham had God's covenant, and God was blessing Abraham, or Abram, so that all who were within his camp were also blessed. But Lot looked outside of the camp, and he saw something that looked very good to him. Now, similarly, these Transjordan tribes were wrapped or covered in the promises of God to Abraham, and they were to receive a goral, or allotment, of blessing from God. But like Lot, they looked outside that covering of blessing and saw something that looked to them to be better. And they settled then for something less. When we look at the actual scriptures where these events took place, we see very vividly what happened to Lot and the similarity with these Transjordan tribes. And we might even glean a little for ourselves in this process. It's interesting that these events, separated by many, many years, occurred very near to each other in location. Looking at Lot's leaving the covering of Abraham in Genesis 13, we see here are the first signs of trouble. In Genesis 13, 10, it says, Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. So we see that Lot looked. Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh told Moses that they saw the territory to the east of the Jordan was ideal for livestock. Genesis 13, 11 says, Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. So we see in Genesis 13 that after he looked for a while, Lot chose. Before asking Moses about the land, Gad and Reuben had already chosen the land outside of the land. Asking Moses was merely a formality. The next steps for both Lot and later the Transjordan tribes would, that they would take, it would also be remarkably similar. Genesis 13, starting verse 12, says, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So we see that the steps that Lot took here, where he looked, he chose, 
he left for, he dwelt near, he pitched his, he pitched his tent toward, he dwelt in, and became a member. The steps that the Transjordan tribes took were very similar. They looked, they desired, they chose, they dwelt in, and they became a part of. You see that with each step, Lot, as well as these tribes, moved closer and closer to temptation until they were finally dwelling in a place of idolatry and temptation. It was by faith that Lot had followed Abraham on his journey and dwelt in the covering of God through Abraham. But when Lot looked out and saw that the land in the Jordan Valley was good for his many people and for his animals, he rejected faith and he chose sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Lot, by choosing to reject faith and walk by sight, ended up becoming a functioning member, even a council member, of that unrighteous city of Sodom. These Transjordan tribes, by choosing to live outside of the land that God gave Israel, would find themselves constantly tempted by the idolatry and the sinful lifestyles of the pagan nations that surrounded them, as well as they would often find themselves under attack by those nations. We could be rightly, or we could rightly say that both Lot and those Transjordan tribes chose their own okay over God's best for them. Now here's the part that will kind of make you slide down in your chair a little bit. The choices that Lot made in these scriptures in Genesis and the choices that these Transjordan tribes made in the latter part of, their bo of this book of Numbers reveal a path that each one of us has walked many times over. And be honest with yourself about it. You know, it seems obvious when you, you read about someone or, or see a friend or a family member and they're in this downward spiral. It seems obvious to us that well, they're making so many bad choices. You know, after they've hit rock bottom, we might, might look over at our friend or our wife or somebody and roll our eyes and say, well, nobody saw that coming, right? You know, sarcastically, of course. It's so easy to tell when other people are making mistakes. In our own lives, though, it's often more difficult to discern. That is, until someone points it out to us or we ourselves reach the bottom. For Lot and Reuben, for Gad and Manasseh, the mistake was not to look, but to keep looking. In each case, they should have said, that looks good, but I'll wait on the Lord. For the Christian, as we are soon going to see with our study in these final few chapters of Acts coming up this Sunday, it's very important that we abide in Christ. But that does not mean that we are going to demerit salvation should we stumble or should we fall. Lot, though he stumbled, was saved from the destruction of Sodom. The Bible later even calls him righteous. Does Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben's decision to live outside of the boundaries of Canaan, does that mean that they would be rejected by God? No. It means that they would miss out on many of the blessings, those blessings that the other tribes that moved into the land enjoyed. It means that they would face more hardships than those tribes, more temptations and more attacks by the enemies. I believe in God's direct will. I also believe in His permissive will. God will, will lift us to the highest level that we'll allow Him to. But sometimes we force God to our level instead of being elevated to His. When we make compromises, we bring God down to our level of commitment. In verse 14, we'll find that, that God says that these tribes, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh, that these tribes have received their inheritance. God allowed them to have the land they desired. 
the land in which they will have great difficulties. Verse 3. Numbers 34, verse 3 says, Your southern border shall be from the wilderness of Zin along the border of Edom. When your southern border shall extend, then your, sh then your southern border shall extend eastward to the end of the Salt Sea. Your border shall turn from the southern side of the ascent of Akrabim, continue to Zin, and be, in, and be on the south of Kadesh Barnea. Then it shall go on to Hazor Adar, and continue to Asmon. The border shall turn from Asmon to the brook of Egypt, and it shall end at the sea. As for the western border, you shall have the great sea for a border. This shall be your western border, and this shall be your northern border. From the great sea, you shall mark out your border line to Mount Hor. From Mount Hor, you shall mark out your border to the entrance of Hamath, then the direction of the border shall be toward Zedad. The border shall proceed to Ziphron, and it shall end at, at Hazar Enon. This shall be your northern border. You shall mark out your eastern border from Hazar Enon to Shephem. The border shall go down from Shephem to Riblah on the east side of Ain. The border down the Excuse me, the border shall go down and reach to the eastern side of the Sea of Kinnereth. That's the Sea of Galilee, same thing. The border shall go down along the Jordan, and it shall end at the Salt Sea, which is the Dead Sea. This shall be your land with its surrounding boundaries. Then Moses commanded the children of Israel, saying, This is the land which you shall inherit by lot, which the Lord has commanded to give to the nine tribes and to the half tribe. For the tribe of the children of Reuben, according to the house of their fathers, and the tribe of the children of Gad, according to the house of their fathers, have received their inheritance, and the half-tribe of Manasseh has received its inheritance. The two tribes and the half-tribe have received their inheritance on, the, uh, on, the, on this side of the Jordan, across from Jericho eastward toward the sunrise. So this is the land that God gave Israel, and, and we have... A map, of course, is kind of like Apple. We, we don't have apps, we have maps. So we, we have a map we could throw up marking those boundaries that God dictates here. To the west, the boundary is the Mediterranean Sea. That's what's called the Great Sea in those verses. To the east, its boundary is the Jordan River down to the, Red, the Dead Sea. Excuse me. To the north, it's from the sea to Mount Hor and across to Zadad. And the southern border is from the Dead Sea along the wilderness of Zin to the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 16. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, These are the names of the men who shall divide the land among you as an inheritance, Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun. And you shall take one leader of every tribe to divide the land for their inheritance. These are the names of the men from the tribe of Judah, Caleb the son of Jephunneh, from the tribe of the children of Simeon, Shimuel, the son of Amihud. From the tribe of Benjamin, Elidad, the son of Kislon. A leader from the tribe of the children of Dan, Buki, the son of Joglai. From the sons of Joseph, a leader from the tribe of the children of Manasseh, Haniel, the son of Ephod. And a leader from the tribe of the children of Ephraim, Kimuel, the son of Shiphtan. A leader from the tribe of the children of Zebulun, Eli Elizephon, the son of Parnach. A leader from the tribe of the children of Issachar, Paul Tiel, the son of Azan. A leader from the tribe of the children of Asher, Ahu Ahihud, the son of Shalomi. And a leader from the tribe of the children of Naphtali, Pedahel, the son of Amihud. These are the ones the Lord commanded to divide the inheritance among the children of Israel in the land of Canaan. So the land was to be allotted to the tribes as supervised by 14 appointed individuals. God himself chose this committee that was to function for that purpose. In addition to Eleazar the priest and Joshua, there was one prince from every tribe that was named. In God's plan for dividing the land, he explained what to do. You know, no plan is complete until each job is assigned and everyone understands his or her responsibilities. 
when you have a job to do, determine what has to be done, give clear instructions, and then put people in charge of each part. Now, I have to admit, I'm pretty bad at doing this. I try and collect all the chores myself and <laughs> do everything on my own. I'm, I used to be much better at it than I am today. Now, we're soon, in October, we've got the extreme tour coming up, you know, and we're going to try and do that up, uh, make it something really nice for the neighborhood, the whole neighborhood here. Um, we'll also use that as uh, the week of our grand opening. We've put that off for a while, um, and for good reason. We've had plenty to do. Um, we've still got quite a bit more to do. Um, but we're going to try, and I mean, this is like surprise, <laughs> but the, 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 the grand opening we'll have, we'll make that week, that'll be the first week in October, we'll make that our grand opening. Um, so I'm going to work better at not trying to do everything myself. Um, and to that, <laughs> to, to, to that, to those purposes, um, I'm going to be asking people if they want to take a lead in certain areas to, so we can prepare. Um, and that's not because I don't want to do the work, it's because um, I want it done well. <laughs> and I'm not the one to do that. Um, so back to our text, anyway. It is interesting here that the land God gives to Israel is the land of Canaan to its boundaries. Now, what's interesting about it is that when you compare the land that God gives them here to the land that God promised Abraham and his descendants within the border of Canaan is a notable difference. The closest to the land of the Abrahamic covenant that Israel ever attained was during the reign of Solomon. And that was not even really that close. Now, does this mean that God's promise to Abraham failed? Or that God has gone back or went back on his promises. Maybe Israel murmured and complained one too many times. And, and, and so God is now giving them less land. They no longer deserved such a grand gift from God. Of course not. What's going on is that God is not through with Israel. Just as God is not through with you and me. The story goes that one day a, a beggar by the roadside asked for alms from Alexander the Great as he passed by. And the man was poor, he was wretched, he had no claim upon the ruler, he had no right to ask for a handout from Alexander. Yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. An advisor, seeing this, was astonished, and he commented, Sir, Copper coins would adequately meet a beggar's need. Why give him gold? Alexander responded, Copper coins would suit the beggar's need, but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. The size of the land, it portrays God's generosity. He always gives us more than we could ever ask or think. When we think God is, is done giving, He proves us wrong. Israel will one day see all the land that God has promised to her. We serve a God who is so generous and always provides more than we deserve. That is so true of my life from beginning with, the, with being in this country to, to having a family, the family that I was born into, to the wonderful wife that he's given me and the, the healthy, Christ-honoring children he's placed in the family. Just as the illustration, copper coins would have been more than adequate and more than I deserve. But God provided the gold. So we move into chapter 35. That might be the same for you guys. I, I don't know. I hope so. Chapter 35, starting with verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give the Levites cities to dwell in from the inheritance of their possession 
And you shall also give the Levites common land around the cities. They shall have the cities to dwell in, and their common land shall be for their cattle, for their herds, and for all their animals. Their common land of the cities which you will give the Levites shall extend from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits all around. And you shall measure outside the city on the east side of 2,000 cubits, on the south side 2,000 cubits, on the west side 2,000 cubits, and on the north side 2,000 cubits. The city shall be in the middle. This shall belong to them as common land for the cities. So the Levites, if you guys remember, they were taken out from the Israelites instead of the firstborn. In Exodus 13, God had told Moses that the firstborn of all the males of Israel were to be consecrated unto him. Consecrated unto the Lord means that the firstborn sons would become priests to God and the firstborn animals would become sacrifices. But God allowed a one-to-one exchange, a male Levite for every firstborn son of Israel, so that every male from the tribe of Levites was a priest. Now, the Levites belonged to the Lord. The Lord was their inheritance. They did not receive a portion of the land that Israel received, but they were given cities to live in, and they were given common land. If you've got the King James Version reading, it probably says suburbs, um, but common land, suburbs, (laughs) same thing. They lived in the burbs. So these common lands, they stretched from the city wall out a thousand cubits, and that area was for the keep and the care of their animals. But then there was another thousand uh, cubits that it went out, as verse 5 tells us, and and that 2,000, that additional thousand cubits was kind of like a buffer zone outside of the city. Now verse 6 says, Now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities of refuge, to which a manslayer may flee. And to these, (laughs) you shall add 42 cities. So all the cities you will give to the Levites shall be 48. These you shall give with their common land. And the cities which you will give shall be from the possession of the children of Israel. From the larger tribe you shall give many. From the smaller you shall give few. Each shall give some of its cities to the Levites in proportion to the inheritance that each receives. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be the cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And of the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. You shall appoint three cities on this side of the Jordan, and three cities you shall appoint on the, uh, in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there. But if he strikes him with an iron implement so that he dies, he is a murderer." The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he strikes him with a stone in the hand by which one could die, and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he strikes him with a wooden hand weapon by which one could die, and he, di- and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. If he, pushes with, if he pushes him out of hatred or while lying in wait, hurls something at him so that he dies, or in enmity he strikes him with his hand so that he dies, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. However, if he pushes him suddenly without enmity, or throws anything at him without lying in wait, or uses a stone by which a man could die, throwing it at him without seeing him, so that he dies while he was not his enemy or seeking his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, 
And the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. (coughs) But if the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the limits of, of his city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood, because he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. And these things shall be a statute of judgment to you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses, but one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. Moreover, you shall take no ransom for the life of the murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. And you shall take no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge, that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the priest. So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore, do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. So the Levites were to have 48 total cities, six of which were to be these cities of refuge. The city of refuge was a city where a person who had killed another could flee before the angry family member, the avenger of blood, could kill the murderer or perhaps before a a mob uh, could exact vengeance. In the ancient culture of Israel, it was not entirely up to the government to avenge murder. The family or extended family, they had a recognized avenger who would ensure that a person who murdered a family member uh, would in turn be killed. This practice was actually based on Scripture. It was based on Genesis 9-6, which says that if anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Now, three cities were to be on the east side of the Jordan River, and three cities would be within the land of Canaan. We have a map of those cities as well and their locations within Israel, or in three instances on the outside of Israel. The city of refuge was not just for an Israelite, but for a stranger or a sojourner, someone who may have accidentally killed another. The cities did not provide protection for anyone who intentionally murdered someone. Now, when we look at these verses, we see that there is a differentiation made between the premeditated murder of a person and the accidental uh, murder of someone. In the case of the accidental murder, He could flee to the nearest of these cities and he would be protected and safe. Now, it should be noted that many translations, including the New King James Version, translate the Hebrew word ratzach differently. When referring to one who kills intentionally, it's that same word as when it says one who kills unintentionally or accidentally. In the first instance, it is translated as murderer, And we also find then, in the case of an accidental murder, we find find the person called a manslayer. Now, however, when we look at the actions that result in the death, there's no differentiation of the verbs. All lead to a person's death. Yet the Bible does differentiate between murdering and killing. The difference is not a a matter of semantics, but the difference is one of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In either case, the person is a murderer. And, And while we may look at the person differently, the law says thou shalt thou shalt not commit murder. Yet God provides a means for the unintentional murderer the unintentional killer to find solace and for the intentional to have a fair trial. But the intentional murderer is not kept from the penalty of his murder, for it is determined that the murder 
was intentional, then that person would be put to death according to the testimony of the witnesses. Now, we may be able to see how this setup would have been a really good deterrent to murder. But there was still a flaw here. What if a death was accidental, but difficult to prove that it was accidental? I mean, a person, you know, might have been chopping wood and, and a, a friend got a little too close into the swing. You know, here in the South, so it probably would have started with somebody saying, hey, y'all watch this, you know, and then smack off of his head. That person, you know, they now had a good reason to believe that the other family's avenger of blood would be after them and would try to kill him. He could then flee to the city of refuge. Having been found innocent of murder, the manslayer could live safely, but only within the walls of the city of refuge. So we recognize that even unintentional killing has a very profound effect. They had to move. Their family had to move. And then they were stuck in the city, possibly for the rest of their life. The only thing that could set the the person free from the city of refuge was, was the death of the high priest. At the death of the high priest, the avenger of blood no longer had any rights over the one in the city of refuge. Now, the Bible shows us by this a few pictures of Christ. The Psalms themselves, they they speak more than 15 times of God being our refuge. Hebrews 6, verse 18 says, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Now, this is a trustworthy saying that Jesus, like the cities of refuge, is open to all, whether Israelite or stranger. There's none who should worry that God will turn them away when they seek Jesus as their refuge. Jesus is also the only refuge for the sinner in need. For without his covering, the sinner will be destroyed. Like the cities of refuge, Jesus provides protection only within his covering. To be outside of the covering of Jesus means death. And finally, it is with the death of the high priest that full freedom comes. Just as it is only by the death of Jesus that we have true freedom. There's a very important distinction that we need to recognize, though. That is this. The cities of refuge could only help the innocent, but Jesus saves the guilty. Let's reread verse 33 and 34. Those say, So you will not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land. For the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. This is the reason for the ordinances of the city of refuge and the execution of murderers. Murder defiles a nation. When murderers are not brought to justice, there is a stain on the nation that only the severe judgment of God can cleanse. That defilement is avoided by bringing murderers to justice. The Bible says that the blood of the slain cries out to God. In our own country, in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. leads the nation in the number of unsolved murders. Alabama comes in at number 17. Of course, that's unsolved, not necessarily unpunished. The Bible is very explicit that murderers should be executed. This nation is polluted with the stain of unpunished murderers. And in many cases, 
in many other places around the world. It's the same. We see with uh, ISIS and, and the martyrdom of, of many Christians in many places around the world today. The, the blood of murdered saints cries out to God, and only His judgment can cleanse the land. It's my opinion, this is just my opinion, but it's my educated opinion, <laughs> that the louder the cry, the closer we are to the soon return of Jesus. Chapter 36. Starting with verse 1. It says, These are the words which Moses... Oh, I'm sorry, I have to start into Deuteronomy. Chapter 36, verse 1 says, Now the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the family of the sons of Joseph, came near and spoke before Moses and before the leaders, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord Moses to give the land as an inheritance by lot, to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of our brothers, of our brother Zolifahad, to his daughters. Now, if they are married to any of the sons of their tribes, of the children of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of our fathers, and it will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So it will be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the children of Israel comes, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So their inheritance will be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Then Moses commanded the children of Israel, according to the word of the Lord, saying, What the tribe of the sons of Joseph speak, speaks is right. Let's stop there a second. This is referring back to Numbers chapter 27. Um, where the daughters of this, this man, Zola Fahad, they were, <laughs> it's a long name, they, we'll call him Zoli, <laughs> they were concerned about their father's inheritance. That because there were no sons in the family, their father's inheritance would vanish. At that time, God declared that in the case that a father has no sons, the inheritance can go to the daughters. But then if the land was given to the daughters and they married, the land would then go to the husband's tribe, and eventually the original tribe would see their land shrink away. Now, like we've all experienced, when it comes to solutions, they often create other problems. Very often a solution requires a trade-off or, or a sacrifice in another area. And when we make a wrong decision regarding the first problem, then the trade-off ends up being pretty great. Now we talked a few Sundays ago about right choices. And we concluded that right choices require right understanding. Something that we rarely have just, of, just in ourselves. This is why mature Christians who make right choices do so by consulting God in His Word and in prayer regarding the matter that they're concerned with. That way, though there may be a trade-off or a sacrifice required, because God is all-knowing and sovereign, by His wisdom we can make right choices, and though it may not be without cost, it will be right. Verse 5. Then Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, What the tribe of the sons of Joseph speaks is right. This is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of Z Zeli, saying, Let them marry whom they think best, but they may marry only within the family of their father's tribe. So the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from tribe to tribe, for every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be the wife of one of the family of her father's tribe, so that the children of Israel each may possess the inheritance of his fathers. Thus no inheritance shall change hands from one tribe to, the, uh, to another, but every tribe of the children of Israel shall keep its own inheritance. Just as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zeli, for Mala, Tirzah, Hagla, Milcah, and Noah, the daughters of, Ze of Zeli, were married to the sons of their father's, 
their father's brothers. They were married into the families of the children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their fam father's family. These are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. So Moses consulted the word of the Lord and he brought back to Israel a godly solution. This was that if a daughter receives an inheritance of land, she must marry within the tribe. Now keep in mind that the tribes were quite large at this time, so that would not have presented any real problem. Now the flip side of this is that if a daughter married outside of her tribe, then she effectively forfeited her right to inheritance. Both she and the tribe originally had a right to the inheritance, and in the case of marriage outside of the tribe, the rights of the original tribe were greater than the rights of the individual. And with this, we conclude the book of Numbers. The book began in the wilderness, and now we finish the book with Israel on the border of the land, yet not quite in the land. The whole generation that came out of Egypt by the hand of God had died off. And as this new generation, they were poised to enter. They were even able to see Jericho from where they were across the Jordan. This is much like the Christian today as we live on the threshold of the promised land. Just like Israel, we've been through a lot, made a, a lot of mistakes, we've learned a lot, we've matured in Christ a lot, but we are not yet there. Still, the Bible tells us in Philippians 1.6, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so, while we are not finished works, we can sense that the day when we are going to be before our Lord is quickly approaching. Israel would enter the promised land. But first, they have more to learn. And so, before we get to the book of Joshua, where Israel does enter the land, we have this next book, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a series of sermons from Moses to Israel, going back over the law, reminding Israel, and even pointing out a few new things. And so, with us, even as we sense the day of crossing coming soon, we still need to review and learn God's Word until the day when God completes the good work that He has begun in us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You, Father, for seeing us through this book. Even from Genesis now to the end of Numbers, Lord, You have seen us through as we have studied Your Word and You have taught us some incredible things. Lord, as we enter this new book, we also enter a new chapter. Not just in the Bible, but Lord, also a new chapter in our lives. Because this is a new opportunity for more growth, to learn more, to grow closer to You, to strengthen our walk with You. And Lord, I pray as we embark on this new chapter that You would encourage us, that You would strengthen us, that You would equip us, and that You would provide for us. That You would do a work in our hearts, a continuing softening, that the seeds of Your Word could be planted and grow a rich crop. 